Now we want to look at the limit of a sequence. And so the question is, we have this infinite sequence of numbers. Uh, are they approaching, getting close to some real number? So the limit of a sequence is a real number, L. And we denote it this way, right? We've used this limit notation before. The limit is n goes to infinity. Is that index goes to infinity, right? And remember, our index in this case uh, is always an integer. So it's a little bit different when we're talking about uh, you know, limits of, of functions of real numbers in a sense. But we'll see here in a minute that we will still be able to use uh, the ideas that we developed in finding limits um, of functions at infinity. We'll be able to use those uh, techniques and those um, rules in order to, in, in helping us to find these limits of sequences. So this limit, uh, L, we say the limit of the sequence a sub n is L if we can take the terms of a sub n as close to L as we desire by making n sufficiently large enough. If this limit exists, we say the sequence converges to the limit L. If the limit does not exist, we say the sequence diverges. So you might uh, recall the language that we used in talking about um, improper integrals, whether they converge or diverge. Right? So very similar language here. Um, now the book will sometimes talk about if the terms of the sequence increase without bound. In other words, their, their um, values are getting larger and larger in absolute value as n goes to infinity. We say that the sequence diverges to infinity. Um, in either case, uh, if the limit does not exist or the limit is plus or minus infinity up here, then a lot of times we'll just say the sequence diverges. I think the book makes a difference between diverges and diverges to infinity, and that's fine. But in general, in both cases, it's the sequence we say is divergent. Um, the value of the limit of a sequence is not affected if we change or drop finitely many terms of the sequence. So again, we're, we're pushing the limit as n goes to infinity. It doesn't matter what the first few terms of the sequence are. They have no effect on the limit. So now if I'm looking at a limit, how would I look at it, visualize that? Um, well, let's take a look at how we visualize a sequence. Uh, let's look at the graph of a sequence, if you will. Now it's going to be different than the graph of a function because the, the inputs are just the uh, integers. And we'll start at 1. Okay. And and so the, the, the value, so, so at 1, what's the value of a sub 1? Well, the value of a sub 1, we can use the, the vertical axis for that. So um, let's say the value of a sub 1 is here. So here's a point, right? And its height is going to be what? That's a sub 1. That's exactly what a sub 1 is. Now what's a sub 2? Well, let's suppose a sub 2 is equal to you know, that value there. Right? And so the height here, a sub 2. Right? And so on. We'll do one more here. a sub 3. Say it's right there. There's a sub 3. Okay, so you get the idea then. The, the a sub 4, let's say, is right here. A sub 5 is here. A sub 6 is here. A sub 7 is here. A sub 8 is here. And so on. So the graph is not like a, a curve through space like it would be for functions of real numbers, right? Because functions of real numbers have inputs for, for all real numbers, everything between 1 and 2, whereas sequences we just have 1. Two. So it's a very, it's discrete, we say, right? And we see just this dot pattern, right? And the question is, are these dots settling down to some fixed value? Okay. So if, if the sequence continues and gets closer and closer to some um, value, and let's suppose that value is, let's do a different color here. dashed line for reference here. Okay, I'm going to call this um, L here. 
right? So in, in this case, it looks like what is this? We proceed, we might have some wiggles up and down, but eventually we get closer and closer and closer to this dashed horizontal line. As long as that is true, uh, and as we say, for n sufficiently large enough, basically, you know, there has to be some point, you know, out here for n equal, you know, 15 or something from 15 on, we are, we are always going to be within a certain um, radius, if you will, or, or a certain distance from this horizontal dash line. If we can always do that, in other words, if I say, make sure that the terms of my sequence are always, you know, between my fingers, that close to that dashed line, as long as that's true from n equal some number for ev you know, on, from that point on, for all values greater than or equal to that, then the limit would be equal to L. And so we would say the limit of the sequence, which would be written this way, is L. Okay. On the other hand, if we have a sequence, and let's just suppose... Our sequence were to look something like this. And it just keeps going up, 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 up forever, right? If these are a sub n's, we could say the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n could be infinity, right? We could be, you know, never settled, never get close to any horizontal line. Another situation we can have where a limit does not exist. So, so in this case, the, the sequence we say is sequence is convergent here. Sequence is convergent. Abbreviate those. Here the sequence uh, is divergent. The book will say it diverges to infinity. Diverges to infinity. Sequence is divergent. And then another possibility is as we we go, we might have, remember that sequence that went like four, we looked at last time, four, two, four, two, four, two, something like that, four, two. If we just keep bouncing back and forth between two values, are we getting closer and closer to some uh, real number L between four, two, four, two? No. I mean, you say, well, halfway between four and two is three, right? If I cut this, cut this in half, right? Here's three. Um, are, but do we get arbitrary close to three. No, if I squeeze down on three, in fact, uh, if I'm just point one above three, three point one, point one below, two point nine, right? There's no, no, none of these points are going to be in that interval, right? We can't get arbitrarily close to three. We're never settling down. The sequence of terms just bounces back and forth between two and four. In that case, we would say the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n does not exist, right? The limit doesn't even exist. Okay? And and, and then, and of course, in this case, again, we would say, again, the sequence is divergent. So, we need to, you know, determine the behavior of the sequence as n goes to infinity. Again, it doesn't matter if I cut off the first few terms, right? The limit is still going to approach L in this case. It doesn't matter if I cut off the first two terms, right? The limit is still going to infinity doesn't matter if I cut off the first few terms, the limit is still not going to exist because we continue to bounce back, right? So again, the idea is what's happening is n goes to infinity. Now, how can we find these limits? So a very useful theorem is, is right here. And that is if f is a function, now I'm talking about a function of real numbers, Okay, a function of real numbers such that the limit as x goes to infinity of the function is L. So we've talked about limits in calculus one and, and at the beginning of the semester really of, 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 of functions um, as, as x goes to infinity, what's the limit at infinity. But also f of n is equal to a sub n for any every integer n, then the limit as a sub n the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n is L. So we're not going to have to reinvent the wheel. It doesn't uh, we're going to be able to use everything we did in finding limits of functions of real numbers, um, including L'Hopital's rule. Uh, remember all the properties of, of limits. If we have the the limit of the sequence a sub n is l, limit of the sequence b sub n is m, 
and c is a constant, then the limit of a constant multiple of that sequence is the constant times the limit of that sequence, just c times l. Uh, the limit of a sum or difference of, of sequences is the sum or difference of the limits. The limit of a product of, of sequences is the product of the limits. And the limit of the quotient of the sequences is equal to the quotient of limits, provided right, the limit of the sequence b sub n is not zero. We would have division by zero then. And so the idea is basically, going back to my, my pictures of, of these graphs, is we are essentially going to find a function that passes through, sort of connects the dots, if you will. Right? We're saying we have a function like this. And if the limit of the, the so if this is the function f, so if the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x equals l, then I'm going to be able to assume the dots are going to go, right? The dots are going to also go to L. Same thing here. If I have this function here, that's the function F, the limit as X goes to infinity, F of X equals infinity implies that our sequence there. And then we could have something like this for this one, right? Where we have, you know, kind of like maybe something like the sine function or cosine function where we bounce back and forth all right that's the function f again we'd say what the limit is x goes to infinity of this function does not exist right we're never going to settle down to anything we're going to keep bouncing back and forth okay and so that's the idea and so basically um we'll, we'll treat really these uh, as functions of real numbers in terms of finding the limit of the sequence. And so let me illustrate this. Um, here's uh, a, a sequence, right? And here we're not interested in listing the first few terms of the sequence. We could. We're interested in finding the limit as n goes to infinity. Okay? So that's the limit as n goes to infinity of n cubed 2n over n cubed. Now, how would we find this limit? Well, what we're, going to, what we're going to do is we're going to think of this as a function of real numbers. Now, I'm not going to change, you know, the variable to like x. I, you know, I can say limit as x goes to infinity of x cubed minus 2x over x cubed, where now we can include um, the inputs to, to be any real number, not just the integers. But I'm just going to treat this as if it was a function of real numbers then. I'm just using the same uh, variable for the index n. Okay, so if this is a function of real numbers, n is any real number, what's the limit as n goes to infinity? Well, the, the top is clearly going to infinity as n gets larger and larger, and so is the bottom. Okay, someone might say, hey, that's infinity over infinity, that's L'Hopital's rule form. Yeah, you could use L'Hopital's rule, but take a look at this. If I simply simplify this first, divide both terms by n cubed, Just simplify. Simplify this. n cubed divided by n cubed is what? That's 1. And n, 1n cancels with 1n. I get minus 2 divided by n squared. Now what's going to happen as n gets bigger and bigger and bigger to this expression? Well, we know, right? The 1 is not going to change, but this thing here, right, is going to go to where? That thing there is going to go to 0. Because n is getting larger and larger. n squared is getting bigger. Uh, 2 stays... 2 every time, right? And so 2 divided by a larger and larger value is getting closer and closer to 0. We say the limit is 0. And so this becomes 1 minus 0, which is 1. And so that's the limit of the sequence. And so the sequence, what converges, we say. Or the sequence is convergent. Or the sequence is convergent. Okay. Well, here's a tough one. What's this, what's this limit? The limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n, in this case, is just the limit as n goes to infinity of 2, right? Sequence is what? 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2. If we're drawing the dots, right? They're all on a horizontal line. They never deviate from that, so clearly the limit is 2, right? And again, we know the sequence uh, is convergent. So 
we've kind of already talked about this sequence uh, already here. Let's see if we come, there we go. Um, all right, so remember this sequence, B sub n. When n was 1, I get 3, plus a negative 1 was 2. When n was 2, I get 3 plus negative 1 squared is 3 plus 1, 4. And then when n is 3, I get 3 plus what? Negative 1 cubed is negative 1. 3 plus negative 1 back to 2. And it just keeps bouncing back and forth between 2 and 4, right? So um, what is the limit of this sequence? The limit as n goes to infinity of b sub n. Well, it does not exist. And the problem is, right, this, this little negative 1 to the n is kind of like what I call a sign changer. But it's because n is bouncing back and forth between 1 and negative 1. We never settle down to anything. And therefore, the sequence, in this case, uh, diverges, or is divergent. Okay, this sequence here, what uh, are we approaching anything? Well, this is pretty complicated looking now. Um, it's not like the, the first example we did where I could easily divide by, if it was just n squared, I might could simplify it. But it doesn't look like I can uh, do much here. So the limit as n goes to infinity of c sub n. It's natural log of n here. Okay. So what's happening? The, the numerator, right, as n goes to infinity, is going to infinity, right? Both of these functions are getting larger as n goes to infinity. Same thing with the denominator. So again, I'm infinity over infinity. And the comment we made with the first sequence uh, I'm going to make again, we can use L'Hopital's rule, and this time I want to use L'Hopital's rule. Okay, so if you remember L'Hopital's rule, I'm going to put a little L over there anytime I'm talking about L'Hopital's rule, just to remind us of that. And how does that rule work? Remember, the limit of the ratio of two functions, if it is of the form 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity, is going to be equal to the limit of what? The corresponding function's derivatives. Okay, so it's real important now we're thinking about n as a function of real numbers in this process, right? n is a function of real numbers, not the dot pattern, but the, but the line going through the dots, right? So now, you know, like 3x plus natural log of x. So what's the derivative of 3x, or in this case, 3n? Derivative is just 3. What's the derivative of natural log of n? 1 over n. Right. Derivative of the bottom function, derivative of two, uh, n squared is 2n, derivative of 2 is 0. Right. And now I can evaluate this limit because uh, as n goes to infinity, right, then um, this term here is going to 0. Right. And what's the form of our limit? What's the form of our limit? As n goes to infinity, the top is going to what? 3 plus 0. The top is going to 3. What's the bottom going to? 2n. n goes to infinity. 2n goes to infinity. Well, what is 3 divided by infinity going to? That's going to 0. So this limit is indeed 0. Now, let's take a look at... Um, Geometric sequences. You remember geometric sequences in the last video we talked about those. Those were sequences where successive terms in the sequence were found by multiplying by some fixed value r. And we're going to look at geometric sequences first where r is greater than or equal to zero. So only multiplying by a positive quantity. And we're going to start with our first term uh, c here in the sequence being greater than zero, being positive. So in other words all the terms in our sequence will be non-negative. And, um, you know, so, so what is the sequence again? The sequence C R to the N. When N is 1, uh, sorry, when N, let's start with N is 0 actually. N is 0, let's go from N equals 0 to infinity. And this is sometimes the way you denote where your index starts, right? for sequences on this way. So if n is 0, I get um, c times r to the 0, c times 1. 
If n is 1, I get cr. If n is 2, I get cr squared. cr cubed. And so on. Okay. And again, it doesn't matter where we start this. Again, the sequence, we're, we're looking at the limit. Again, it doesn't matter what the first few terms are we're talking about. But the question is, what's what are we approaching way out here? Okay. Well, let's think about this then. Uh, assuming c is greater than 0. If c was equal to 0, right, all these things would be 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and the limit would be 0. Um, but let's look at the, the case where r equals 1 right here in the middle. If r is 1, all of these are c, right? c, 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 c. And therefore, the limit is equal to c. So that's pretty easy to, to c, <laughs> s-e-e. -E. All right, so c, 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 limit is going to be c if r is 1. Now, what if r is greater than 1? Let's look at that. So if r is greater than 1, like, like 2, let's say. So this would be c, this would be twice c, this would be 2 cubed, 2 squared, rather, 4c, 8c. And since c is positive, what's happening to the terms in the sequence? They're just getting larger and larger and larger, and therefore we're going to go to infinity. And in that case, of course, the sequence, we say, would, would diverge. For r equal 1, the sequence converges. Now, if r is... Uh, zero um, up to but not including one so between zero and one including possibly zero obviously if r is zero we know what's going to happen right this is c and then this is zero 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 so we'd certainly get zero but what if r is between zero and one like r is a half right what happens if r is a half and and let's just let c be one okay for instance c is one I get 1 times a half is a half. 1 times a fourth is a fourth. I get an eighth. I get a sixteenth. I get 132nd. I get 164th, right? What's happening to those numbers? Getting closer and closer to 0. And that's true for any value of r between 0 and 1. The limit is going to be 0. Okay? So we're going to look at the geometric sequence for values of r that are less than 0 here in a minute. Um, but I wanted to start with that. So, so it's important to know for geometric sequences that when R is between 0 and 1 inclusive, both of these cases we get a finite limit, either 0 or C. And so uh, the sequence is convergent in these cases. And of course in this case the sequence diverges. Okay, so if R is positive, then uh, or non-negative, we know the sequence is convergent for r between 0 and 1 inclusive and then divergent for r greater than 1. And that's an important thing to remember. Now, before we look at values of r in the geometric sequence that are negative, I want to take a look at the squeeze theorem for sequences. Remember the squeeze theorem uh, for sequences of real number, uh, functions of real numbers. Uh, we use that um, to find certain limits. It's a helpful thing. If n, uh, capital N, is some integer such that uh, we have three sequences here, a sub n, c sub n, and b sub n. And c sub n, the terms of that sequence are always greater than or equal to a sub n, but less than or equal to b sub n, trapped in between the terms of these two sequences. For, for any value of n that's greater than this fixed integer, capital N. If also the limit of the a sub n's and the b sub n's exist and are both equal to L, then the limit of our sequence is also going to be L. And so, you know, what's going on here? So, let's suppose the, the a sub n's are a sequence that looks like this. the a sub n's and the um, b sub n's look like this maybe okay. so that when we take a look at this you know we might conclude at least graphically here this is L 
So these are the uh, A sub ends here and the B sub ends here. Then we can conclude what it looks like the limit as n goes to infinity of the A sub ends is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of the B sub n. Looks like they're both equal to L. They're both right, both sequences are getting closer and closer. Right, sort of like a horizontal asthop again if we drew the function connecting those points both of those functions would be approaching L. Okay, but then we've got a sequence, right, and we said what C sub n is trapped in between the A sub n's and the B sub n. So if I begin to draw that sequence, right, then the C sub n, the C sub 1 has to be between these two, right, so somewhere maybe it's right here, and then it has to be between these two, maybe it's down here. All right? And we can have some bouncing around, right, maybe, but eventually what's going to have to happen in between here and here between here and here, we've got to get closer and closer what? To this same, we're getting squeezed, right? The squeeze there, we're getting squeezed. We can't bounce around it. We have to stay. And so, therefore, the C sub n's, the, the limit as n goes to infinity of the C sub n's is also L. So I get squeezed down to that same limit. Squeezed down to that same limit. Okay, so that's the that's the squeeze theorem. Now I'm going to use the squeeze theorem to show the following. If we have the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of the terms in the sequence, if that is zero, then the limit as n goes to infinity of the a sub n goes to zero. Let me prove this first. Okay? And what I'm going to start with is a sub n, the terms, the sequence we're trying to show is equal to zero, given this sequence we know is zero. So if this is true, I'm trying to show this is true. So I'm going to take these sequences. I'm going to squeeze them between two sequences. And here's the sequences I'm going to squeeze them between. That sequence and this sequence. Is this statement true always? Well, um, if a sub n is positive, say 4, the absolute value of 4 is 4, and this would be what? Negative 4. Is 4 uh, between negative 4 and 4 inclusive? Yeah, it's equal to 4, but again, this is less than or equal to here. So that would be true. What if a sub n is negative 3? a sub n is negative 3. Then this would be what? Absolute value negative 3. Positive 3. And this would be negative 3. Is negative 3 between negative 3 and positive 3 inclusive? Yes. Again, this is less than or equal to. So, so a sub n is always going to be bounded between these two. And since what the limit as n goes to infinity of the va absolute value of a sub n is equal to zero, we also know that the limit as n goes to infinity of negative a sub n is also to zero, equal to zero. Negative one is just a constant multiple. I can pull it outside the limit, provided the limit exists, which it does, and then a negative one times zero is equal to zero. So they're both going to go to zero, and by squeeze theorem, therefore, the limit as n goes to infinity of the a sub n's is also zero. Okay. Now it's real important that we realize that this theorem that I've just proven using the squeeze theorem is only true if right we're approaching zero. Okay, if we're only approaching zero. Alright. So for let me give you an example of a function. So apply this result to evaluate this limit, right? Well, notice that if I look at the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of the terms in the sequence. All right? So these things are bouncing back and forth. If I look at the n equal 1, I get negative 1. n equal 2, I get positive 1 half. n equal 3, I get negative 1 third. All right? n equal 4, I get positive 1 fourth. So they're kind of alternate between positive and negative, but this, when I take the absolute value, all those negatives become positive, and this is just the same as the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 divided by n. Well, that is clearly going to 0, right? As n goes to infinity, 1 over n is going to 0. And so, what do we have? By this theorem we just proved, the limit as n goes to infinity of negative 1 to the n over n is also going to be 0. Okay. So, so the idea is there is we're we're approaching um, uh, 
right? This sequence negative 1 over n, as I said, starts out with n equal 1. We get negative 1, so we're down here at negative 1. And then, then we're positive 1 half at, at 2. 1, 2, 3. And then we're negative 1 third. And then we're positive 1 fourth. And you see we, we're bouncing back and forth, but we are indeed getting closer and closer to the x-axis here. Right, even though we're bouncing back and forth, it's not like we're not going to settle down like the, the one that went between 2 and 4, 2, 4, 2, 4, 2, 4. This is bouncing back and forth, but it's getting closer and closer to 0. It's getting squeezed down. If I looked at the absolute value, right, the absolute value sequence, then this negative would become what? Positive. This negative would become positive. This negative would become positive. And you see what's happening, right? We're getting closer and closer to 0. So the absolute value of the terms, right, as we said, goes to 0. And by this theorem, the terms in our sequence also go to zero. Even though they're bouncing back and forth between positive and negative, they're getting closer and closer to zero. Okay, so real important again that we, we realize that. And so with that, we can now say the following. Let's go into the finish out our geometric sequences. We did for r, remember, greater than or equal to zero. Now what's happening if r is less than zero? Okay, well, if uh, c is not equal to zero again, then for values between negative 1 and 0, the limit is going to be 0. And why is that? So if I take a look at the limit as n goes to infinity of c r to the n for these values of r, right? Then, then what's going to happen, right? It's, r is like negative 1 half. Right, r is like negative one half, and so uh, when n is one, I get negative one half. When n is two, I get positive one fourth, and then negative one eighth and positive one sixteenth. And I'm multiplying c, which is uh, not equal to zero; it's either positive or negative. The bottom line is the the sequence is going to alternate in sign, right? Positive between positive and negative. But you know, if I look at the absolute value now, right? absolute value, then that gets rid of the negatives and positive. And now instead of r being, you know, r still negative one half, but it's essentially going to be in this situation positive one half, right? So now we're going to talk about, uh, let's say c is one and r is a half, and we're going to get one half, one fourth, one eighth, one sixteenth, one thirty second, and so on. So that's clearly going to go to zero. And since that is true, therefore, the limit as n goes to infinity of c times r to the n is also zero. Using that theorem we just proved, if the absolute value of the terms, that limit is going to zero, then the limit of our sequence is also going to be zero. Right. Now what happens if r is uh, great, uh, less than or equal to negative one? Okay. Well, if it's, if it's equal to negative one, then, then clearly that sequence is going to to diverge, right? Um, and, and what's going to happen, uh, the sequence is going to look like this. If r is equal to negative 1. It's going to be c, first term. Multiply c by negative 1, negative c. Right? Multiply negative c by negative 1, c, negative c, c, negative c, and so on, dot, dot, dot. It continues forever. Remember, c is not equal to 0. So this is bouncing back and forth between a positive. It's not getting squeezed down to zero, right? It's like three, negative three, three, negative three, three, negative three. So it's just like that two, four, two, four, two, four sequence. The limit does not exist. The limit does not exist. And it's only worse if r is, is less than negative one, like negative two, because then, you know, if I, if I do r is negative two, I would have like c, and then what, negative two c, and then positive four c, and then negative eight c, and then positive 16 c, so as I'm, as I'm looking at that sequence there, you know, that the sequence is alternating between positive and negative, but it's also getting further and further away, it's sort of, you know, diverging to, to infinity and negative infinity in two separate paths, N certainly not going to approach any fixed number. Okay, so putting all that together, we have the following. So, so again, notice we're convergent, sequence is convergent here and sequence is divergent here. So I'm going to connect this with the 
cases when r is greater than or equal to zero that we looked at and here's the full story for geometric sequences uh, notice if r is less than one in absolute value right so this means that r is what between negative one and positive one then the limit of the sequence is zero if r is equal to one the limit is c in these two cases right we know that the sequence is convergent if r is greater than one or r is less than or equal to negative one then the sequence diverges divergent okay, and that's what we're saying here then we know that the sequence geometric sequence converges if r is greater than negative one and less than or equal to positive one okay um, I just want to finish this out real quick a couple things um, when we are looking at um, limits uh, of sequences and we have compositions of, of uh, some from some function where our sequence is inside that function we can push the limit inside the function provided that function is continuous and that will help us to evaluate the limit so let me illustrate that with this case cosine functions domain is all real numbers and it's continuous in its domain so I can push this limit through in this case and this becomes the cosine of the limit as n goes to infinity of 3n plus 1 divided by n squared plus 5n minus 7. All right. Now what about that limit inside the parentheses? Some of you know and remember how to do these, but let's uh, look at this. The limit as n goes to infinity 3n plus 1 over n squared plus 5n minus 7. Well as n goes to infinity the top is going to infinity and the bottom is going to infinity so what good old rule am I going to use here probably Bloppy Tall's rule right so the derivative of the top with respect to n is just 3 the derivative of the bottom is what 2n plus 5 and clearly then as n goes to infinity the top stays at 3 but the bottom is going to infinity right so this is 3 divided by infinity form All right, so that is going to go to 0 and so that tells me what about this limit this limit is equal to what the limit as n goes to infinity of cosine of this is cosine of this limit that's cosine of 0 what is cosine of 0 though 1 so the limit of our original sequence here is equal to 1 so I'm able to push the limit inside the function evaluate that limit of that sequence and then I can take the cosine of it. Okay, a couple things to close out, just a couple things uh, just to finish out. There's other ways to determine whether uh, a limit of a sequence exists or not. And here's some ideas here. First of all, a sequence is called monotonic if its terms are non-decreasing or non-increasing. So non-decreasing, if I'm doing non-decreasing, then the sequence would, as I'm graphing it, uh, I can I, values can go up, right, or they can stay the same, right? They can go up, or they can stay the same. They can't go down. They can't go down, right? So it's non-decreasing, always going up or staying constant. Non-increasing means I'm always going down or staying the same. Okay, that's what we mean by monotonic in this case. All right. Well, let's take a look at this sequence. We've seen this sequence before. I already know it. I'm going to write it out, right? n is 1, I get 2. When n is 2, I get 4, 2, 4, and so on. We've seen this. Right? So is this monotonic? No, because we increase, and then we decrease. And we increase, and then we decrease. It's badly not monotonic, right? So this is not monotonic. What about this one? Is this one uh, monotonic? Well, it, it's a little tricky here. You know, you, you can list some terms like we did here. Um, we take the limit as n goes to infinity. We probably know what that is. But, you know, what's really going on? How do we determine? Well, if we think about when we were in calculus 1, let's just look at the function f of x equals 
2x divided by 1 plus x, right? That passes through all the points of the sequence. And, and then, then the question becomes, where is this function what monotonic? Or where is it non-decreasing or non-increasing? Well, what do we determine? How do we determine if a function is increasing or decreasing? What did we use? The derivative, right? If I take the derivative of this function using what rule? Quotient rule. Right. What do we get here? The derivative of the top is what? 2 times the bottom minus the top times the derivative of the bottom, which is just 1, all over the bottom squared. If I clean this up a little bit, what do I get? Distributing the 2, I get 2 plus 2x and then minus 2x. Well, the 2x minus 2x is gone. I'm just left with 2 up top divided by 1 plus x quantity squared. Well, think about this. For any value of x, and here, of course, we're thinking of x being greater than or equal to 1, right? Since we're you know, looking at terms of a sequence that start at n equal 1, 2, and 3. So let's start with x being 1 and, and on. But the denominator doesn't really matter what x is. As long as it's not negative 1, we clearly got a problem, but we're okay. We'll say x is greater than or equal to 1. The denominator is always positive, right? Because I'm squaring what's over in here. It's always positive. 2 is positive. So this is always greater than 0. Uh, for x uh, greater than or equal to 1. And therefore, f is what? Increasing on the interval from 1 to infinity, right, the function. But our, our dots are following this function, right? The, the dots, if you will, the, the points on the, the sequence b sub n. And so the sequence b sub n is monotone. It is non uh, decreasing. It's only increasing. Okay, so increasing would be monotonic. Okay. Um, now, with, with monotonic, now I want to talk about. couple other things and we'll be done here. A sequence is bounded above if there's a number m such that every term in the sequence is less than or equal to that m for all, well not every term, but for all, um, could be for any any fixed number at some point, right, we can say too. But the number m is called an upper bound. A sequence a sub n is bounded below if there's a number little m such that a sub n is greater than or equal to little m for all n or all n past a particular particular value. So the idea behind you know, what's going on here right, is if, um, let's say, here's capital M, and we'll just draw a dashed line for capital M. If the points of my sequence, right, look like this, And they're always below, right, this, and, 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 you know, it could be that over here we, we pop above big, you know, at this, this line over here for a little bit. You know, as long as from this point on we're always below that dashed line, then M is, is an, uh, considered an upper bound. And certainly any number bigger than M would also be an upper bound. So we can have, you know, many upper bounds, uh, infinite number of upper bounds for a given sequence. Okay. Whereas a sequence, on the other hand, a sequence that did something like this and just shot off, right, where the limit was going to infinity, it would never have an upper bound, right? So any value of m, we would eventually surpass it and always be above it for, uh, for all values of n past that point. Similarly, we have, the, you know, bounded below means, you know, there will be some you know, value like, like maybe the uh, m equals zero down here if we're always um, above all our points are above the um, x-axis, then, then zero would be a lower bound for that sequence. Now, if the sequence is called, a sequence is called bounded if it's bounded both above and below. So, um, a sequence that is not bounded is called an unbounded sequence. Okay, so if we're bounded above and below, that means we're going to be squeezed in between a band, right, right? All the points will be in between if we're a bounded sequence. 
the sequence here is not bounded, right? We escape. <laughs> the points escape and never come back in between that, that band, right? That bounded region. So, here's a nice little theorem then. If a sequence converges, then that sequence is bounded. Sequence is converging, then that sequence is bounded. Okay, and that kind of makes sense if you think about it, right? For approaching some fixed number, right? Getting getting closer and closer to some fixed number, you can see that we're going to be bounded, right? And again, right? And it may be, you know, you know, we're talking about for all values maybe greater than or equal to eight or something, right? We're always between two two values here or whatever it is, but we're going to be bounded. Obviously, this is an unbounded sequence, and 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 you can see why. Okay, now. Look at the converse of this though. This sequence here, the, the limit does not exist. The sequence diverges. This sequence is still bounded. Okay. So again, it says what? It says if the sequence converges, then it's bounded. It doesn't say the converse, which is if, if the sequence is bounded, then the um, sequence converges. Or is that the inverse? I get those all confused. Anyway, <laughs> the, the opposite is not true. If the sequence is bounded, then the sequence is uh, not necessarily convergent. Um, the final theorem, though, is every bounded and monotonic sequence is convergent. So if it is bounded and it's monotonic, then it's convergent. All right? And that should make sense, right? So if I'm monotonic, I'm non-decreasing or non-increasing, right? So here was, here's... Uh, uh, well, that's not a good example. That's not the example we did. Um, so, yeah. so if if we're bounded and monotonic, so this sequence was non-decreasing, right? Always going up or staying constant, right? If we're bounded, then that means what's happening here? You're going to have to eventually, since you're you're either going to settle off and be constant forever, which you reached a limit, uh, or you're getting closer and closer to this upper bound. And so, so if you're bounded and monotonic, then you must be convergent. So that's another way we can prove convergence of a theorem. Can you think of a sequence that's monotonic but not convergent? Monotonic but not convergent? Sure, there's a lot of them. Here's an example. That's monotonic, right? It's non-decreasing, right? And is one, I get one. And is two, I get four. And it's three, I get nine, and it's four, I get sixteen, right? It's just blowing up to infinity, right? It's monotonic, but it's not convergent, so that's easy. Can we think of uh, a sequence that is bounded but not convergent? It's a sequence that's bounded but not convergent. Well, there's lots of those as well. Here's one. So this would be what cosine one, cosine two, cosine three, cosine four, and notice the the cosine. So basically, if I were to graph the, the cosine function, right, it would look like this. And then our our sequence, though, so, you know, cosine of one is going to be a positive number, right? In fact, wh where is this at? This is what cosine of pi over 2, which is about, what, 1.57, right? Here's negative 1 at, what, cosine of pi, which is about, what, 3.14. And then we're back here at 3 pi over 2, uh, and so on, right? But So the sequence would be, what, at... Um, Cosine of 1 is going to be, you know, less than 1 point. It's going to be somewhere here. It's going to be positive. Cosine of 2 is going to be, you know, down here is going to be negative. Cosine of 3 is just shy of pi, so it's just here. It's going to be still negative. Cosine of 4, negative. But eventually, right, we're going to hit points where what? We're, we're positive, right? We're above, right? So I don't know, whatever they are. Um, but, you know, some will be positive, some will be negative, okay? And, and so the sequence, right, the dots are not going to settle down to any limit, right? We're just bouncing back and forth. We're not getting closer and closer to zero or any other number. 
But this sequence is clearly bounded, right? Because a sub n is always between what two numbers? Negative 1 and positive 1. Right. So there's an example of a bounded sequence that is not convergent. Okay, so uh, there's plenty of homework on this, so please get busy trying those uh, problems and uh, let me know if you have any questions.